introduce our next speaker. That's my, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Professor Michal Vandenberg from Hasselt University. And his talk is on HMS symmetries and the decodifications for toric boundary. We don't hear you. Microphone. Uh, Professor Vandenberg, it seems that your microphone is muted. Is it okay now? Yeah, sure. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, let me... Um, Okay, um, yeah, so I hope there will be no technical problems because uh, I, I normally have a very reliable internet connection, but just now it's been uh, been very flaky. So now I'm using my cell phone to give this lecture. So everything, I hope everything will be okay. Um, so what's the lecture about? Well, um, um, The lecture will be about around about the idea that um, in certain circumstances it's useful to think of fundamental groups of uh, topological spaces acting on derived categories. So most of the lecture will be a survey of existing results. So if there are people that already know this, so then bear with me, because towards the end there will be some new results. Okay, so first of all, to make things simple, the uh, base field will be the complex numbers. And uh, I will be talking about singularities, and they will always be uh, Gorenstein singularities. So Gorenstein is called Macaulay with um, trivial or locally free dualizing sheaf. And we will also be interested in, in, in uh, resolutions of such singularities and resolutions of a particular kind, namely Grepin resolutions. So, um, so the definition is written um, there. So basically, if we have a resolution of a singularity, we can sort of measure uh, the, the resolution in the way it changes the dualizing sheaf. And if it doesn't change the dualizing sheaf, then we call it a crepent resolution. And, and for various reasons, these resolutions are particularly interesting. Now, such resolutions need not exist. If they, if they exist, then they're usually not unique. Um, so to give a, a basic example, if you look at like the three-dimensional quadratic singularity, x, y, z, w, then that already has two distinct repent resolutions by blowing up either of these uh, two single uh, sub subspaces. And uh, so the birational transformation between those two resolutions is called the Atiyah flop. And uh, about the existence, if we, if we look at the uh, hypersurface singularity, which is given here. So if n is two, this is the conifold, then this has a crepent resolution if and only if n is even. Now, um, when, uh, so crepent resolutions are not, not unique, 
but nonetheless, they appear to be very strongly related. So for example, it's a by now a classical result that if, if we have two crepent resolutions, then they have the same Hodge numbers. And actually, uh, this ID somehow comes from physics. So X is singular, so it also has Hodge numbers, but these are sort of the wrong ones. We really want the um, Hodge numbers of a crepent resolution. And there's some formula that gives these so-called Trinity uh, Hodge numbers, which also works if a crepent resolution does not exist. And then they are called, then they're not integers usually. So then um, there's a categorification of this result that's been proposed by Bondal and Orloff and independently by Kawamata, which says that um, if we have two crepent resolutions, then the, the derived, their cat, derived categories are uh, equivalent. And, and there's overwhelming evidence that this conjecture is correct, but it's still wide open. Now, um, the conjecture only asserts uh, the existence of an equivalence, but of course, there's sort of an obvious functor we, you might want to consider. If I have two crepent resolutions, I can take their fiber products and then sort of pull back to the fiber product and push forward. Uh, so this is called the fiber product kernel. And this does work for the Atia flop, but we should note it's not the only equivalence. But anyway, it's a very nice canonical one. But uh, the fiber product kernel does not always work. So if we take cotangent bundles of dual Grassmannians, then uh, Cortis has shown that they are, um, well, I mean, they are uh, both crepent resolutions of a no potent orbit closure, and they are derived equivalents, but the derived equivalence is not given by the fiber product kernel. And the simplest case of this is G, uh, G24, which was already uh, known by Kawamata and Namikawa. Now, um, the conjecture is open in general, but nonetheless, there's some, uh, uh, there's many cases where it is known. So it's known uh, in dimension three by Bridgeland. Um, it's known uh, for toric varieties. And actually in the rest of the lecture, this will, uh, will be mentioned again. It's known for symplectic singularities, where, which is very interesting because there we actually use reduction mod P to prove this. And then uh, it's known for, um, I mean, GIT, geometric invariant theory, allows you often to construct crepent resolutions. And there are many crepent resolutions for which the conjecture is known. Now, as I said before, um, there is no statement about what the equivalence should be. And it's now more or less understood that one, one should not expect a canonical equivalence, but rather what one should expect is that there is some topological space and the equivalence between them should depend on the path uh, to connect two crepent resolutions in that space. So here's the, the picture for the conifold. So recall the conifold had two crepent resolutions. So, I mean, uh, so the topological space in that case is p1 minus three points so p1 so it's p1 over the complex numbers p1 is a the complex numbers is here so we take out three points so these are punctures and then the the two crepent resolutions appear here as some points and then to any path from one crepent resolution to the other one, one obtains a derived equivalent. So I have, have pictured two paths, but I could have made much more complicated ones and, they, and it would still work. Um, Quick question. Okay, so there, in, in, the, in the, well, for now, I'm going to try to explain 
uh, why this what happens in the case of the conifold. Now the conifold can be defined in many ways. So as I already said, it's a three-dimensional quadratic singularities. But uh, another way to uh, to understand it is as a, a quotient singularity. So take a one-dimensional torus and make it act on four-dimensional affine space uh, with weights one, one, minus one, minus one. Then if you compute the quotient, so the quotient is given by the functions which are invariant, and there are four invariant functions uh, for this action, and they satisfy indeed the equation of the conifold. And with this picture, we can also get the two preference resolutions because uh, we can remove two sub-varieties from the four-dimensional affine space. And if I remove one of those sub-varieties, then the, suddenly the action of the torus becomes free. Uh, and then, and, and, uh, yeah. I mean, this sort of looks like an open inclusion, but it's a feature of this theory that it's actually a proper map. And this gives you the two crepent resolutions. Now, uh, there's some, another technical thing I need, which is windows. Um, so if I have a group acting on an algebraic variety, I um, I, I can sort of take the quotient as I did here. I mean, so, but I mean, this is sort of not really the wrong the right thing. So the, one should, one should, one should really take something called the quotient stack, uh, basically, which is some geometric object, but it has a category of coherent sheaves and the coherent sheaves is nothing but the G equivariant coherent sheaves. Now, if we have a quotient stack, and if the group does not act with uh, finite stabilizers, and then the, uh, the derived category is usually very, it's not finitely generated, it's very big. So uh, we want to tame it somehow. And to, the way to tame it is to look at finitely generated subcategories. And, and, and let's call these window categories. So a naive way to do this is to take some representation of the group and then take the subcategory generated by, uh, by this representation times the structure sheaf. And um, what's interesting about these window categories is that they actually give rise to non-commutative rings. So basically, um, they are modulus categories of the non-commutative rings. Okay, uh, so this was this was sort of a general fact for any uh, reductive group acting on any variety, and even more general. But now let's go back to the conifold. So recall that the conifold was about quotients of one-dimensional torus, and the representations of the one-dimensional torus are indexed by the integers. And then for each integer, I mean, I can construct an equivalence of categories. So first of all, I have the window category is a subcategory of the quotient stack. Then I can uh, take the restriction and on the restriction, the torus acts freely. And then the quotient stack is really a genuine quotient. Another thing we can do is tensor by L1. And this sort of shifts the window categories. So this is called the window shift. So basically we have two sources of equivalences of categories, both involving window categories and one of involving the equivalent resolutions. And I can uh, compose this in many ways and that this gives me many auto equivalences. Now a way to organize all these um, equivalences is in a, a z-equivariant local system of triangulated categories. So you probably know about uh, 
local system on topological spaces, so they're just a local, uh, locally constant sheaf of finite dimensional vector spaces. And a typical way to uh, obtain such a local system, if we look at uh, systems of linear differential equations, so then uh, locally, the solutions form a finite dimensional vector space, but um, there are usually no global solutions. So to go from one local solution to another local solution, um, well, the, the proper way to define the lo local solutions is by a sheaf, so a local system. Well, it's a classical fact that if I have a local system and I take the fiber in an arbitrary point, then I get a representation of the fundamental group. And, and this is actually an equivalence of categories. And another way to, um, to specify a local system is just using the fact that it's a sheaf. So we can take an open cover and the, the, on which the local system is trivial and then uh, give the, uh, the sections on the on that open cover. And uh, the two points of view are equally convenient. Sometimes it's more convenient to think about a local system and sometimes it's more convenient uh, to talk about um, the sheaf. So, um, so I defined um, some triangulated categories. First of all, I had the window categories and then I had the uh, derived categories of the Kreppen resolution. So I can make this into a z-equivariant local system, not of vector spaces, but of triangulated categories. And I've done this somewhat schematically. So I have, um, I've given an open cover. And so this, so the black dots, there are punctures, they should be removed. And then I've given sort of an open cover, but I mean, I left some white space uh, make the picture clear, but in for the real open cover, there would be no white space, of course. Then the blue and the, the green opens, they contain, well, the sections there are the derived categories of the prep and resolutions. And then the, the orange open sets, they are the uh, window categories. And then the Z action I defined in the last slide, I'm sorry, here. Uh, this uh, is given by the horizontal black arrow. Now, first, if I forget about the Z action, then I get an, uh, an action of pi one minus Z on the derived category of, of the, one of the Kreppen resolutions. But if I, if I take the Z action, the Z action is free, so I can quotient it out. And I really, so then I really get a Z action of pi one of C minus C divided by z. So we got a space c minus z divided by z and you can see this is the same as pi 1 minus 0 1 infinity which we encountered before. So this is our sphere minus three points but now we see where it came from and also if we go back to the picture here then we see near the poles we have the commutative resolutions. And then uh, on the equator, so we get sort of the non-commutative resolutions. And actually, in this case, there's only one non-commutative resolutions because they're all uh, transformed into each other by the Z action. OK, uh, so this looks like a sort of very particular example. But actually, it's part of a sort of a common pattern. So basically what we have is uh, a complex affine space and we have taken out uh, a complexified hyper, um, affine hyperplane arrangement and quotient out by a lattice. So in the conifold case, N is just one. The F1 hyperplane arrangement is Z. So it's complexification in this case will also be Z. And the lattice is also Z. Um, 
then the um, commutative Krepin resolutions recall they're sort of near the poles. And they're, um, they're part of the uh, complement of a central hyperplane arrangement, which is associated with the affine hyperplane arrangement. So in the conifold case, the affine hyperplane arrangement is Z. So the corresponding central arrangement is a zero. And if I take the complement of zero in R, I have two connected components. And this gives me my two Krepin resolutions. Uh, and then the non-cumulative Krepin resolutions, and I haven't defined this, but there's also a notion of Krepinness for non-cumulative resolutions. They are given by sort of the equator, which is this. Now, um, so the conifold case is a very small picture. So in general case, in the general case, this, this pattern will also allow for resolutions which are partially commutative and partially non-commutative, but there is no room to incorporate this in the conifold picture. And so some cases of the pattern, I mean, there's Slosovy slices, which are um, slices to no potent orbits. I won't say anything about this. Uh, so a more general is symplectic resolutions of symplectic sing uh, singularities. So this is an ongoing project of Bezrykavnikov and Akunkov. And you can find a, actually a video on the internet by a lecture of Akunkov, which gives a very uh, similar picture as the, um, as the conifold picture I've given. Now, um, again, in this case, there are the, there are the commutative resolutions. These are just the symplectic resolutions. And there are the non-commutative resolutions. And it's very interesting that these are actually given by um, uh, um, quantific, uh, uh, quantizations in characteristic P, which you then afterwards lift to characteristic zero. But there doesn't seem to be, as far as I know, really a way to construct these and understanding these properties by doing this characteristic P trick. Then, uh, so in a sense, uh, the ultimate generalization of uh, Richmond's result in a three-dimensional case is worked by Yama and Weems, uh, which discuss in general this picture for Krepin resolutions. And then I already I already mentioned uh, JIT quotients, and uh, so in, in the picture in this case is known for so-called quasi-symmetric representations, um, and uh, so basically a symmetric representation is a representation which is isomorphic to its own dual. Uh, and quasi-symmetry is a weaker version of this, which will come back below. And then uh, I said, the picture is common, but not universal. Well, if you go to non-quasi-symmetric representations, they do not satisfy the pattern. And again, I will come back on this later. Now, if we have a local system of triangulated categories, we can take its K0 and complexify it. And this gives me a local system of complex vector spaces. And it turns out that this is often given by the solutions of an interesting differential equation. And here is such a very classical differential equation, the hypergeometric equation. And then it turns out that if I uh, decategorify the local system of the, the conifold, I get the solutions of the hypergeometric equation for trivial parameters. Now, this may be slightly disappointing because uh, if you look at trivial parameters, the hypergeometric equation loses much of its interest. So, but there is a way to fix this, which I sort of mentioned once and then uh, not more, not not again, 
basically, instead of with derived categories, you can use equivariant derived categories. So recall the conifold, what's a portion of four dimensional affine space by a one dimensional torus. So this means that there's still a three dimensional torus acting. So you can look at uh, equivariant uh, derived categories for this three dimensional torus. And then uh, actually you get uh, a local system not of vector spaces, but of modules over the representation ring of this three-dimensional torus, which is all around polynomial ring in three variables. So I can specialize this. So I, then I get a, a local system of depending on three parameters. And this is exactly the hypergeometric system. OK. Um, now we're going to um, to look at a particular kind of singularities. These are um, Gorenstein affine toric singularities. So they are associated to a, a polygon, so um, a lattice polygon. In um, yeah, I mean I, I can't say it better than it's written there. And then by taking a cone over such a, a um, polygon and then taking the dual cone and then taking the lattice points in that dual cone, this gives me a monoid and the spec of that gives me a, a, a Gorenstein affine toric variety. And um, if we take the square, so when you sort of ignore the last coordinate, which is one, because it's an artifact that the polygon needs to be in a particular hyperplane, um, then we get uh, the, the conifold. And then it's part of this theory is that one uh, decrepit resolutions of uh, such a affine toric variety, they give by the lean Manfred stacks, and the lean Manfred stacks are they're orbifolds, so I mean, if if you don't know what this is, one can just ignore this. Uh, one gets crepent resolutions by triangulations. So recall the conifold was corresponded to a square, and it has two triangulations, and they are correspond to the two crepent resolutions. Now, such a, a triangulation does not necessarily give you a projective crepent resolution. So for projective crepent resolutions, an, an additional condition is necessary. The triangulation should be the projection of a, uh, a piecewise linear convex function. So on the left, there's a picture of this. And uh, you cannot always do this. So on the right, there is a triangulation which cannot be obtained in this way. So it will still give you a, a crepent resolution, but the crepent resolution will not be projective. Needless to say, that the two triangulations of the square are regular, so they are projective. And actually, yeah, I mean, um, resolutions you get by ge geometric invariant theory are always projective. Now, um, so the regular triangulations, they're associated to some functions. So you can look at the collection of all such functions, and these can be assembled in what's called a fan. So a fan is a collection of cones, and this is called the secondary fan. Uh, so it's a it's a, a complicated object. It was in, introduced by Gelfin, Kapranov, and Zelewinski, and uh, so in general, it does not correspond to a hyperplane arrangement. So I said. That in 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 the nice in nice in the nice cases the crepent resolutions will be somehow correspond to uh, connected components in the complement of a hyperplane arrangement. Well, uh, for a Gorenstein affine toric variety, this will not be the case in general. Now, as I said, the uh, the um, the uh, secondary fan is a complicated object. 
but there is one case in which it's easier to understand. Um, well, there's a way to understand it better, is to write the the um, so the toric varieties as quotients, uh, toric quotients. So then they're given by a finite number of weights. And uh, so then the fan is uh, is a fan in the character group of the of this torus. And then I can define what quasi-symmetric is. So quasi-symmetric means that the sum of the weights is zero for every line to the origin. So here's an example. Uh, if we take a two-dimensional torus, then the character group is two-dimensional. And then uh, I've, two, I've given two collections of weights. On the left, there are six weights. And by, just by taking the lines through these weights, give me the, gives me the secondary fan. And we see the fan is not corresponding to a hyperplane arrangement. But if I choose the weights in a symmetric way, then it is corresponding to a hyperplane arrangement. Um, okay. Uh, so nonetheless, there is there is conjecture what our topological space should be in general, complete generality, even if it's not the complement of a hyperplane arrangement. So basically, uh, this is given here. Um, basically, uh, to a set of lattice points, we should associate a Laurent polynomial. Then we should look at the, this, the single locus of this Laurent polynomial. Uh, this would be give me one uh, divisor, and then you have also have to do it for uh, faces. Anyway, I mean, for people that know it, can uh, re refer to the definition here. I hope other people can believe me. So then uh, the upshot is that there is. In in the F, in this affine space, there is some hyper hyper surface which we should take out. And then uh, define and quotient that by some group. This gives me a quotient which, in general, is is a billion Mumford stack. Uh, and this is our topological space. So uh, in the case of the conifold, always doing the conifold. This Laurent, uh, I told you. The um, the polygon uh, is is spanned by these vectors, and we take a to be all the vectors. So this is my um, Laurent polynomial. I hope you can see how this Laurent polynomial is obtained from the columns of this matrix. This this is homogeneous. If I give z degree one and the other variables degree zero. So the, for the, to consider the singular locus, I only need to take the uh, the derivatives with respect to the variables. So uh, this Laurent polynomial will be singular if these equations have a common zero, and this is uh, equivalent with a d minus b c is different from zero. So. For, according to the recipe, we also have to consider the faces of, of this polygon, and if we do this, we get uh, we get what our um, uh, SKMS is. It's this quotient where the group action is like this, and ultimately um, we get back our usual. Um, uh, sphere minus three points. So the big conjecture is that um, pi one of k a acts on any Crepin resolution by auto equivalences, and uh, in the quasi symmetric case, uh, it's shown by kite that k a satisfies the, the standard pattern. And in that case, the uh, SKMS conjecture was already known by uh, 
well, basically by Hopper and Leisner. Sorry, I forgot one important. It's Hopper, Leisner, and Sam, not just Hopper, Leisner, Hopper, Leisner, and Sam. And they used work we did before, which painter and kind of work. So in the, in the non-quasi-symmetric case, as, uh, as far as I know, very few examples are known. So some examples were checked by uh, Kite and Siegel, uh, which appeared in, in Kite's PhD thesis. Now, uh, these examples were basically done by, um, by the fact that, as I told you, the SKMS conjecture is open, but it's actually, uh, to some extent, no near infinity. So near infinity, we have sort of all crossings. I mean, and so this 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 standard picture that um, prepent resolution should be correspond to the complement of a hyperplane arrangement so the fails, but near infinity we still have walls and we can do wall crossing, and then uh, um, so this is in particular. Um, so and, and in some cases, is the picture near infinity enough to prove the SKMS conjecture? So in particular, this gives you the examples considered by Kite and Siegel, and that's the methods. And it also gives you, uh, it's sufficient to prove the bundle of karmatic conjecture for toric varieties, which was what I started with. Then I should mention that pe people among you have probably heard of the Virtual mobilized space of stability conditions. Well, there, there's a close relation, but the two are not the same. And this is all that I want to say about them. I mean, it would be a lecture by itself to say anything about this. Okay, um, if the SKMS conjecture is true, then we also want to know what is its decategorification. And it turns out that there is a a sort of famous uh, system of linear dif differential equations, which generalizes the hyper um, hypergeometric equation, which I gave earlier. And um, well, again, I mean, if you know it, you can refresh your memory here. Otherwise, um, I will just give an example in the conifold. So recall the conifold um, was given by these weights. And basically, the, in that case, the GKZ system uh, sort of consists of four equations. So three of them are sort of Euler type differential equations, uh, which contains, which correspond to the rows of A. And the fourth one is this one, um, yeah, which I will not. Say, and here the right hand sides are parameters that they can the scalars that can be chosen freely. And then the conjecture is that the decategorification uh, of the of the SKMS, SKMS conjecture should be the GKZ system. And again, uh, to avoid choosing a parameter, we can we can uh, work with equivariant derived categories. Uh, and in the quasi-symmetric case, this is verified by Schwenko and, and me. And then again, there are all crossing results near infinity. Um, so finally, we come to new results. So if I have a toric variety, I assume it's smooth, then by definition, a toric variety has a dense orbit for the torus. And the complement of this is a uh, divisor. Well, in the smooth case, it's a normal crossing divisor, which we call the toric boundary. Uh, and so what we can show with uh, Spela is that, uh, so pi one of the SKMS of Y acts on, on the Dirac category of the toric boundary. So not on the full Y, but it does act on the derived category of its boundary. 
And more of, moreover, we can just describe the decategorification. So uh, it's written here. And uh, so it turns out that the decategorification is very closely related to the GKZ system. So it's a GKZ system up to trivial uh, local systems. So how do we prove this? Well, actually, the proof is based on homological mirror symmetry. Uh, so recall that um, to a choice of lattice points, we can associate a Laurent polynomial. We can take its generic fiber. We can make this into a symplectic manifold. And then Gamache and Chende and, 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 and Zoo. So the, the proof of Gamache and Chende it was not 100% general. So, I mean, so there was some slight thing which was filled up by Zoo. Shows that um, mirror symmetry in this case, so the derived category of the um, toric boundary is the, the Fukaya category of a generic fiber of this Laurent polynomial. And then, uh, so then all we have to do is prove that this Fukaya category gives a local system. Now the Fukaya category is known to be invariant under deformation. So you expect it to be a local system, but there's still some technical things to check, which we did. Uh, so why does it only work for the toric boundary? Well, uh, I mean, I'm running out of time. So let me say that um, the, the, the mirror, so the, the dual, the mirror dual of the full toric variety is a Landau Ginzburg model. And it is not known to construct the Fukaya category of a, Lind a Lind Landau Ginzburg model in full generality. So as far as we know, not enough is known to. Uh, to, go, to make it into a local system. Uh, and then, um, okay. So, um, okay, let me stop here. So let me just say that there's some work going on. Then, okay, thank you.